Our scripture today is John chapter 7, 25 through 44. That's a, another longer passage, so instead of reading it all at once and then going back through it, we will again read it as we go along. The question that confronts us today is, is it easy to believe that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah and our Messiah? The Jews sure had a lot of trouble with it, as we'll see. They knew their scriptures, but they didn't see how they applied to Jesus or how Jesus fulfilled so many prophecies in himself. To start with, they definitely understood that Jesus was um, claiming to be their Messiah. And they also knew that their leaders weren't believing it. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? You know, they would be trying to kill him because in their culture, it was a capital offense to claim to be the Messiah if you were not actually the Messiah. Then they note that Jesus is speaking freely. Here he is, speaking publicly, and they are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? The people want to know, if the authorities don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, then why are they allowing him to keep talking and saying he is? Why haven't they already arrested him? At the same time, they had their own reasons for not believing that Jesus is the Messiah. They said, but we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. That's what they believed about the coming of the Messiah. But there is a difference, you know, between what they thought they knew and the actual truth about where Jesus was from. They thought he was from Nazareth because that's where he grew up. But apparently they didn't know that Jesus was actually born in Bethlehem. So their statement about the Messiah was true. No one knew where he was from. They themselves didn't even know. They just thought they did. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. And I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. You know, this means that though they might know about Jesus' human origins, that does not mean they knew all about his true divine origins or where he really comes from, from heaven. Then he told them where he really was from. It seems rather vague to us, using pronouns, he who sent me is true. And then he tells them they do not know the one who sent him. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him. And he sent me. How are we to hear what they heard that got them so angry? You got to remember all this conversation centers around Jesus' claim that he is the Messiah. Now if Jesus is the Messiah, then the Jews ought to know that he was sent by God. So Jesus was claiming that he was sent by God and is now claiming that their failure to believe in him is proof that they don't really know the God who sent him. But he's talking to Jews, the chosen people of God, whose father was Abraham, who were rescued from slavery in Egypt, who were brought into the promised land and also expelled into exile as punishment for their many sins. These are the people who finally learned their lessons about the danger of worshiping idols and were more focused on God than ever. How dare anyone say that they don't know God who has actively and miraculously cared for and disciplined these people for so many centuries. Now that they have the temple restored to them, they are proud of how well they think they do know God and how much they think he has blessed them lately. And here is Jesus saying, you don't know God. Basically, those people felt the same way you and I would feel if anyone said to you or me, you're not really a Christian. You don't know God like I do. That was their reaction. So that explains why at this point, 
They tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. I wonder what that really looked like. You know, if a movie director tried to depict this scene, you might see Pharisees and guards straining to move, hands clawing the air, faces consorted by the effort, yet held frozen in their tracks by some unseen force. Yeah, but I think it's more likely that some of them wanted to jump him, but wiser, cooler heads held them back to wait until they could find a more opportune time. Because to arrest him in public would upset many of the common folk who really liked him. They didn't want to risk making a scene or potentially causing a riot. And that motive is expressed outright later on. This is recorded in Matthew 26, 3 through 5, where the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or there might be a riot among the people. Still, many in the crowd believed in him. They said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? Jesus already has an impressive reputation as a miracle worker. And these people were willing to believe in Jesus based on the works he did. In in another place, Jesus will say, don't believe on me just because I tell you who I am, but believe in me because of the works I do. Some of them were already doing that. But the Pharisees did not believe Jesus to be the Messiah. They didn't like it that Jesus was getting more popular. The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. And then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. They sent in the professionals. Though no one laid a hand on him, or maybe because no one laid a hand on him, the Pharisees sent the temple guards to arrest him. They sent in the professionals. And again, Jesus was not arrested, even though the guards were sent. This time, it was because the guards were impressed by Jesus and didn't see anything wrong with him or worthy of arresting him. You know, this detail is actually part of next week's reading, where the Pharisees asked the guards, Why didn't you bring him in? And the guards say, probably with a sense of awe, no one ever spoke to us the way this man does. And this is what they heard. Jesus went to his preaching. Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time, and then I'm going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. With our 2020 hindsight, we know that here Jesus is talking about his death and resurrection. I'm with you only for a short time. He knew that he wasn't going to live much longer, but would be crucified during the next Passover. I'm going to the one who sent me, means he's going back to heaven after his death and resurrection. And also after his death and resurrection, people did look for him and did not find him. They found the empty tomb. And they never located his dead body anywhere, because there isn't one. And where Jesus went, back to heaven, nobody can get there, unless Jesus takes them there. But the Jews who were listening at that time just had more questions. They asked one another, where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, you will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? They have all these questions, but Jesus didn't answer those questions. Sometimes God just lets us wonder about things. Instead, he went back to preaching his message. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty Come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now remember, this is during the Feast of Tabernacles, 
or Sukkot. As described in the book of Leviticus, this holiday is a time for the Jews to rejoice in God's bounty, whether it is his salvation in taking them out of bondage in Egypt or providing them with a plentiful harvest. In the Feast of Tabernacles coincides with the end of the harvest season. In fact, this year, Feast of Tabernacles starts October 9 for us. So we're pretty much on track preaching this message today. <laughs> the time marked a joyful celebration of the harvest as well as a remembrance of God's provision during Israel's 40 years in the wilderness when they lived in tents or tabernacles. And that's why it's called the Feast of Tabernacles because they would build little temporary outdoor shelters and live in them to remember how it used to be when they were wandering to the Promised Land. Ultimately though, Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles, celebrates our trust in God and relying completely on our relationship with Him. And many consider it the precursor and inspiration of our American Thanksgiving Day. It takes place between September and October, as I mentioned. And interestingly, the Feast of Tabernacles was also described as a key time of revival. When the returning Israelites came back from exile to rebuild the temple during the time of Ezra, they established the foundation during the Feast of Tabernacles. It's also likely that the Gospel of John began by making reference to the Feast of Tabernacles when he wrote that Jesus came and dwelt or tabernacled among us, where it says in John 1.14, the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And I like how Eugene Peterson puts it in the message. God moved into the neighborhood. And here I would point out that when a believer receives the Holy Spirit, that is God coming to dwell with believers in tents of human flesh. God is still tabernacling with us today. The gift and grace of his holy presence inside us is really something to celebrate. Hallelujah! The Feast of Tabernacles for the whole Jewish year is the last of the appointed feasts and concludes the festive calendar. I'm giving you a little history now. As such, it, it anticipates the culmination of God's purposes for Israel. The final fulfillment of God's promises for and through that nation. To emphasize perfection and completion, it occurs in the seventh month, lasts for seven days, and the number of its sacrifices is divisible by seven. In relation to the other feasts of Israel, we can see Israel's ancient history reenacted every year. I want to summarize them all briefly to you so that you can see the significance of what Jesus was doing when he was talking about water. The earliest, earlier feasts build up to the climax and finale of tabernacles. The calendar begins with Passover, the starting point of the Exodus. The people are set free from slavery and begin to become God's holy nation. Next, the Feast of Unleavened Bread signifies Israel's period of consecration, which in the New Testament corresponds with baptism and the washing with water through the word while the old yeast was the influence of paganism, unleavened bread represents Israel removed from its sinful influence. Shavuot, or Pentecost, is the second of the harvest festivals and traditionally associated with the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. It also became attached to the giving of the Holy Spirit on the day the church was born. The blessing promised to Abraham would be his restoration to the rule of God with all its glorious benefits. The law of Moses brought about that restoration partially until the Holy Spirit was given on the same day 2,000 years later to more perfectly fulfill God's promise of the law written on our hearts. Then there's this long intermission following Pentecost it signifies an indefinite period of Israel's history, largely marked, as we know, by apostasy and disobedience. And then the last three feasts all occur in the seventh month, the sabbatical month. The Feast of Trumpets is the first, signifying both the call to battle and the call to repentance. 
It commences the season of repentance and precedes God's judgment on the Day of Atonement. When the faithful part of Israel receives forgiveness and is preserved and sanctified while the other part is cut off for its sins. Now during tabernacles, all native born Israelites were required to live in tents for seven days in remembrance of the fact that I had Israel dwell in tents when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God, Leviticus 23, 43. It was from this history that Israel had to understand the feast's significance. Also during that time, even God himself went with them in his tabernacle, the one that Moses set up, with God's abiding presence, that column of fire by night and smoke by day, and by his leading, Israel entered its promised land and conquered Jericho. The Feast of Tabernacles also commemorates that. The host of Israel marched around the city for seven days when they're conquering Jericho and seven times on the final day. At the blast of trumpets, Israel gave a loud shout and the wall collapsed. You know that story. The culminating event of the Exodus was ritually reenacted in the temple during the Feast of Tabernacles as an integral part of its celebrations. On every one of the seven days, the priests formed a procession and made the circuit of the altar, singing, Oh, then, now work salvation. Yahweh, Yahweh, give prosperity. Quoting Psalm 18. But on the seventh day, the last and greatest day of the feast, that's the day that Jesus is saying what he's going to say, the priests made the circuit of the altar seven times, remembering how the wall of Jericho had fallen in similar circumstances and anticipating how, by the direction of God, the wall of the heathenism would fall before Yahweh and the land lie open for his people to possess it. Now another thing, also on each day of the Feast of Tabernacles, during this ceremony of the procession around the altar, water was poured out on the altar with loud exclamations of joy, symbolizing the Holy Spirit and commemorating the victory that is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And that is why it was so significant for Jesus to say what he said. I already read it. Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from them, from within them. And by this, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Also, this would represent repentance from sin using the imagery that Jeremiah employed when he said in Jeremiah 2.13, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Through Jeremiah, God was calling his people back to himself to receive the living water. Now Jesus claimed to be that living water. He is the source of the blessings anticipated by the feast. And that made a big impression on the people. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. That is, the one that Moses said would be like him. Jesus' words about living water probably also reminded them of when Moses made water pour out from the rock to provide for the children of Israel. Others said, he is the Messiah. More and more people are beginning to believe in Jesus sincerely. But there's always room for confusion along with faith, as we see next. Still others asked, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus, the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. This is now the third time we read that some wanted to arrest him on this day. 
but his time had not yet come. Is he or isn't he the Messiah? The reader must decide. Another point of confusion lies in the fact that a little earlier in this chapter, when Jesus said they were trying to kill him, the crowd said he was crazy. And yet they knew, at least some of them do know, that the leaders want Jesus dead. And yet the leaders were still allowing Jesus to teach publicly. Thus we have two opposite claims, really both happen within minutes on the same day being recorded in this gospel. The confusion, do they want him dead or not? Some think they do, some think they don't. There's another pair of confusion opposite claims too. At the beginning they said, no one will know where the Messiah comes from. Yet at the end of this section, as we just read, they say they know he will come from David's line, Bethlehem. But it wouldn't have been hard for them to find out that Jesus really was from Bethlehem. So, some disqualified Jesus from being the Messiah because they knew he grew up in Galilee. Jesus can't be Messiah because they think they know he didn't come from Bethlehem. Others said no, because if we do know where he came from, that's why he can't be the Messiah, because no one's going to know where the Messiah comes from. Confusion, such confusion. I believe John is demonstrating that faith in Jesus as Messiah is not based on irrefutable proof, but rather based on the Holy Spirit helping us. As a discipleship manual, these verses help prepare believers to answer all kinds of objections about Jesus. And so the door is open. If you don't want to believe in Jesus, you can find excuses to deny his true identity. But there is enough evidence to enter into the joy of faith that saves. And then there is the blessed Holy Spirit who really works in our hearts to enable us to believe. And when we come alive in faith by the power of the Holy Spirit in us, it really is like rivers of living water that give life and refresh us to walk with God more faithfully. Thanks be to God. Let me lead us in a prayer. Lord, I thank you for how your Holy Spirit in us clears away the confusion. Christ is born in Bethlehem, fully man, fully God. Christ lived and died to prove that he is the Savior of the world, died on the cross and was raised again to new life, proclaiming the victory over sin and death so that we, by faith in Jesus, could live forever, humble and obedient servants, repentant of our sin and following our Lord and Master. We thank you for the glorious life that is ours to come because we believe this gospel. And we, I pray that all who hear this message have or will Put their faith in you, O Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name.